can have Josh up there in a second. Uh, this part of the program is just called Federal Agency and Foundation Perspectives. I want you guys to hold forth, tell us things. Mark, starting with you. Okay, so this is gonna be- You always wanna go after Mark. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened, but okay. <laughs> So this is going to be um, coming in from the West Coast. So we pull Turn your mic on in particular. Just not on. Uh, now it's a bright green. Okay. Um, so let's see. So I, I'm, I'm the director of the Institute for Education Sciences, which is one of the largest investors in um, education research. Um, it's also a 20-year-old organization. And um, it's been a long time since I had a 20-year-old kid but 20 year old kids are incorrigible. They have energy, they explore, they want to you know, do all kinds of new things. A 20 year old, we are. So when, so the, when, when uh, Amy had her four pillars up there, the last one was culture. And I would say the four things that really matter, culture, 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 and culture. So, um, so the other things of course matter, and I could tell you all the stories about dealing with OGC, the Office of General Counsel, and, and, and I think one of the lines that Amy didn't uh, uh, actually call out, which is really important, is like, there are not enough yes for us, right? And I mean, again, Amy, right, there's a lot of stuff in the slides, but the things that, that actually affect the daily life that I live is OGC, culture, culture, and culture. So let me, let me give you some some thoughts about what we're doing and some of the challenges that we face. And, um, and you know, I've talked to Amy a lot. She was on a couple of panels with, with the National Academies that, that, we, uh, that we commissioned. Um, but so it, it's really like different levels of the world that are going on, right? So I talked to Amy, she says, what about this? What about that? And I said, you know, we're already competing. We just did a project with, the Nat, uh, with uh, NCES, one of the centers in uh, IES. And it is so, like, there's just a different reality that we're in, right? So Amy says, do this, do this, do this, and we're on this project. We have all these privacy protecting technologies. And I'm telling you, sorry, Amy, like on a daily basis, like, who's she? <laughs> and what's she talking about, right? I mean, this is the way we do things. And, and I cannot, as, as, and Amy knows me and a couple other people here know, like I've been pushing for four and a half years, trying to make things happen, and I have a year and a half left. And, and the other day I was talking to my daughter about some of the problems, and she said, Dad, blow it up and leave. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm sorry, and I'm thinking like, I, it's not in my nature to do it, but it's getting awfully close, <laughs> right? So to blow things up and leave, okay. So maybe it is in my nature, but. <laughs> But I'm trying not to, because I, I think there's, you know, this is a, a, a really good organization, but it, it's, as I said, 20 years old uh, for bureaucracy is like, I don't know, the sclerotic maybe? You know, nobody hears from their organization for 20 years. So at least one of them, you know, like I can't hear from them for most of the time. Anyway, look, so I, I do have some prepared comments, um, and um, I'll just go through them briefly because I think the more interesting question is, um, the discussion that'll, that'll follow. And um, so look, I mean, the bottom line is that, um, so most of the people in here are, are, are totally into privacy protection, open source technologies and, and the importance of privacy technologies. Um, and and that, that is fundamental, right? We can't lose our data. We can't let our data leak out into the world. I, I have been, every organization I've ever worked in has been hacked. And I, I don't know, like how many different personal records of mine are in China? I mean, they've been stolen from the, from the government several times. They, when I worked at AAR, they were stolen from AIR. When I worked at the university, they were stolen from the university, right? And none of it is fun, uh, and it happens. And we want to minimize that as, as, as much as possible. But when we talk about education, uh, we talk about a very complicated world. And I, I think Jim is referring to some of this. You know, the, we have one of the most heterogeneous systems in, in, in the world. Um, and I think he said, um, if we want to design a worse system, we probably couldn't, but uh, it's what we got. Um, and the data is held in many different places, and, and some places are really good and really good at losing data, and some places are really bad, and, 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 um, and it, that's just the reality. 
there are 14,000 school districts, which are the major unit for, for education in the United States. And um, probably more than half of them have one school. So we're talking about you know differences in the capacity and differences in viewpoints and differences in needs that are amazingly heterogeneous across a, across a continental-sized country. And we always have to remember how, just how big, how different, and heterogeneous uh, this country is. And, and I think it's really easy, especially being around Washington, D.C., uh, to forget about that. And it's really easy to forget that the culture and the, and the risk-benefit analysis that different people do in different parts of the country in different locations is radically different. So I think Amy was getting to something that was really important towards the end of her last few comments about a common vocabulary. I'm not sure exactly if that's the way I would put it, but I think what we really need is a much more sophisticated discussion in many levels and in many languages that say, look, integrating data, getting big data, getting massive data, I love the fact that Amy's gone beyond big data to massive data. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of stuck with the little bit of data. <laughs> it's like, oh, why do I have massive data? Okay, so anyway, um, but we have to make people understand that privacy protection is one side of an equation, right? There are benefits and there are costs to merging data, for example. And we, it's not a simple black and white issue. It's not like, oh, we have to do privacy protection and therefore we're gonna only shut everything down. Well, that doesn't work because there are real benefits to merging data, to having big data, to having massive data, right? So the problem that I think we have is an, an inability to talk seriously about the benefits and the cost of privacy protection, right? We could do like uh, differential privacy. I mean, I, I don't know how many times Amy you know, pulled her hair out. She obviously pulled out mine much more successfully. Um, in, terms of, in, in terms of like what privacy, uh, differential privacy has done to the census, for example. So there, again, we, we have to be careful about the benefits and costs. It's, it's, we live in a gray world, not a black or a white world. And we have to convince people that there's a balance in that and that, the ri that there are risks that we must take in order to move, uh, in, in order to move forward. So I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we've been doing at IES. And, and a lot of this has to do with the world, the evolving world of data, big data and merging data. So we put out an RFI, a request for information uh, about big data sets. So, um, so there, there are a couple of findings. We, we got oh, 100 and some odd responses. There are a couple of findings that are important, and I think they, they all relate to the, to the discussion today. So the first one is that all the comments we got all recognize the importance of big data, right? And when we talk about big data, there are many definitions of it, but most of it had to do with large end samples often created from multiple data sets, right? So, so we knew that we, there is a widespread recognition that large data sets are needed to advance the field. The second thing that was noted is that we don't have them, right? There are very few of them uh, that, that are available and usable by researchers, by policymakers, by others. And the third part of the RFI uh, that was really important is that it was uniformly noted um, that contextual data is incredibly important, right? And I think this goes back to Jim's point about you know the heterogeneity and what works well for you doesn't work for me and doesn't work for Jim, right? So, um, and the only way we could start parsing that out is by having much better contextual data. But obviously, as soon as we ask, start adding contextual data to it, any level of data, you get to some exposure data, you get to some stuff that violates Scott's discussion. Well. Uh, an, um, uh, exponentially. So, so the, the field wants them, and all of them are going to be uh, in, increase the risk of uh, being disclosed. <coughs> the other thing that's actually happening is not only contextual data, but the combining of data sets is obviously what leads to Duke, right? And the Evidence Act and the Secure Data uh, Service. There, I mean, the common application, all of these things are going to make data sharing much easier and may even make it the norm. But again, as soon as you start merging data, what might be secure in one data set is no longer secure when you combine multiple data sets. 
So this is, I mean, this is one of the challenges, but the, the ship moving towards combining data to create big data is like going. I mean, we, we're not, we're not going to stop it. So we need to figure out the best way of minimizing the risk of combining data sets and adding uh, uh, contextual data. So another theme um, in the RFI was the need for um, fairness and equity in the data. And this, um, and this came up several times, um, and this is why I think the work that Jim is doing and Amy is so fundamentally important. Um, you know, the algorithms, we need to make sure that the algorithms are fair, the results are fair, but I'm not even sure how, what that means, right? I mean, I understand, like, okay, how do, you, how do I judge someone's algorithm to know whether or not this is fair and uh, ethical? I mean, I, I have no capacity to judge this. I mean, we have some egregious cases that you noted the one in the, in the UK, so we know that didn't work, but how do we know that it's, there are you know, more subtle things going on, more subtle forms of discrimination, more for, formal, uh, informal, I'm sorry, more hidden ways of, uh, of in, in inequities being discovered. So let me go back to my challenges um, and IES's challenges. So we collect tons of data, right? Um, NCS is the third largest federal fiscal agency in terms of dollar value, in terms of education, it, has, it collects more data than probably anybody else with regard to education. So again, going back to the fact that it's a 20 year old uh, agency, um, we know some of the challenges, we know some of the things that we should be doing, but getting them done is not as easy as saying we should get these things done. So we, we're trying to figure out how to make uh, our data more available in a contemporary fashion, so we did the Black Coleridge Initiative, for example, uh, we, did, we did a project with Amy about secure multi-party computing, um, so we're, we're trying, we're trying to figure out different approaches, more modern approaches, but culture matters and staffing matters, right? I mean, they, like, I said, we're gonna do this, and, they, and, and my answer is like, where are we gonna get the resources for this? And it's usually not money. Uh, there is enough money if you're smart about it. It's really about resources, people. It's really about skilled people who are committed to doing the work, right? So one of the things that we're trying to do is to create a new center in IES that will translate the Center for Training and Education Enters, which is going to be um, ARPA-ED, which um, I was in the Bush administration from 05 to 08. We started talking about ARPA-ED then, and then this is close to 20 years later. We are getting closer as to whether or not we pull it off. But, but the purpose of NCAID would be to create a different culture. And look, I mean, so, so this is a typical government solution. I can't solve the problem I have with my existing resources and my existing people, so let's build a new one, right? And that's what we're gonna do, right? We're gonna build NCAID, and it is gonna solve many, I, I hope, I plan, I pray that it solves many of the problems I have, but like, it, it's a cultural shift that, we, that, that, that NCAID is, is about as much as anything else. But we need to make sure that the data that NK data, NCS data, whatever new forms of data we collect, we need to make sure that they're used, and, and that they're used, useful, and usable. We need to make sure that these things happen. So I'm gonna give you an example, and, and John's been working on this, John has been working on this, and it's a challenge, right? So we've been trying to figure out how to do challenges. So we pulled off a very successful math challenge. We think we're gonna pull off a reading challenge. But the biggest challenge that we are, are planning is one on writing. And this gives you some idea of all the challenges that we're talking about. So students don't write. And the reason they don't write is, is if anybody's ever been in a classroom taught in a, in an elementary school, uh, actually junior high school, but high school, you know what the problem is. I, I, when I taught in junior high school, I had 150 students in five different classes, right? If I gave an essay a week, I had no time to do Right. In part, the essays weren't very good, so they needed a lot of feedback, they needed a lot of attention. And over time, you just, like, I can't do that, right? So maybe you gave two writing assignments to, you know, over the course of the year. Well, if you don't write, you don't learn how to write. You never get better at it. And the way it's structured, we cannot, we cannot increase the amount of demands on teachers 
who gives more writing. It just doesn't. So our challenge, what we're planning is a challenge on uh, to create an artificial uh, intelligence driven writing. But to do that, you need a training data set. And you need a very large training data set, which means you need thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of essays. Well, we have that. NAEP has 235, this is the National Assessment of Education Progress, NAEP has 235,000 student essays. So John was involved in a lot of the negotiations trying to open that, that database up. And this is just one. NAEP has lots of other data in it. It's like, you know, it's a, it's a national assessment. Um, hundreds of thousands of students are tested every two years. So we say, okay, give me those, give me those essays, right? Just give them to me. And whatever we need to do to preserve the privacy of them, to scrub them, then I'll take care of that. We're not even in charge of NAEP. It was months of negotiation, and finally we have we have something like forty thousand out of the two hundred thirty-five thousand. So, so we are doing whatever we can. And, and I'm sorry, that's not the right way of putting it. We are making sure that those data are privacy protected, that they're all anonymized, um, and then we're going to. The goal is to put them out in, as a public data set. So we, we're envisioning a couple of challenges, some technical challenges, and some, um, and, and then one big challenge for an automated, the automated um, um, writing tool. But, but this was not an easy thing to do, right? So it required a mindset change, a culture change, like, oh, I have hundreds of thousands of essays locked up over there. Why don't we make them available? It, 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 it's like I, I, no one ever thought about it. And then as soon as I said, well, let's do this, and again, thanks to John, um, it's like, whoa, like, we don't do that. We don't do that. Well, yes, you do, right? But, you know, again, I mean, how many things can, can I do by myself where I'm pushing a bureaucracy this way? So it, it's going to happen, but it took months and months and months. Hopefully, the next, the next ones will be easier to, to, uh, to do. So, so we're thinking about what, ki what other kinds of challenges are possible, and we're running up against a problem that sort of implied in some of the things that Amy said, is that the capacity not only in IES, but in the field. So, um, so we have created the industry. IES is one of the major forces behind creating the education research industry and AIR, RTI, SRI, app, all those things. Well, we created this industry. I mean, we're, that's an exaggeration, but we certainly keep it big, fat, and happy. So, um, so the question is, like, do, do, they, do they have the capacity? Do they have the capacity to do the next generation? Well, they could hire faster than we can. But the question is, like, how lazy are they, right? I know how to, I know how to get IES money. I'm, you know, I, when I was at AR, I know how to get money, right? I have a whole you know, staff that's geared to get money from Gates, money from me, from anybody who's giving out money from Shamar, right? So the question is, <laughs> okay, anyway, but the point is, like, what happens if we start asking to do new things? Well, we're running into problems with the challenges. So they say, we're used to you paying us to do work. And in a challenge, someone wins at the end, but people are putting out work to win the prize. Right? And, and they're saying, like, I don't want to do that. Right? Pay me to do that. That's not the way challenges work. And, there, and we're running into we're running in, 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 into that. Let me just talk about a couple of other things that are happening. I'm done. You, talk, you asked me to come and talk. So I'm talking. It's the joy of inviting Mark. Mark, okay. I'm going to cut you off. All right. I'm done.
Thank you. <laughs> Mark, you can you could either have your own remarks or yes, Mark. I'm going to comment on Mark. <laughs> the best way. Um, I think a couple of themes that jump out to me. So, um, I worked in the Obama administration for just under eight years. Now I work at a science and tech foundation. We work with Mark a, a ton. We work with Amy, um, and we work with a number of people in this room. I, I would sort of just highlight a couple of key themes that Mark mentioned. So one is, I think it's really important to work backwards. So I find it very useful. I find it very useful as a policymaker. I find it very useful as a funder to say, what actual thing in the world are we trying to solve that these technical improvements allow us to land? So when I was in the government, the use case I would always make about privacy is I would say, um, the first lady at the time had an initiative on military families and children. Military families move all the time. It's usually really hard to get your school record moved. You have to like get that huge file and bring it with you and if you don't remember to do it, your new school doesn't know. And states, when they tried to set up agreements so that you could actually move your school data when you moved, found it really hard because the rules were not preset. You could move it. And whenever I would tell this story, it would be like, do you want it to make it easier for families when they move state lines because there's a new base deployment to have the rules of the road to be able to do it? I get a lot of yeses. And then people are like, well, what do we need to do to, to do that? And so my question is, like, you always have to start backwards. So for example, what I find really, you know, Amy has done a bunch of this work. I, there's a set of folks who are like, how do we take the work that happened under the hood for college scorecards, which is, you know, data cannot leave the IRS when it connects to wages, but people through building really strong interagency partnerships were able to take the data that Department of Ed had bring it into IRS, link it to wage data, and then bring out you know, linked file that showed what cohorts wage were. That's had a huge impact in being able to make a difference between different types of college. People want to do that for more social programs, including workforce programs. I think being able to tell somebody, hey, in this economy, you could take two things that look very similar, could either put you on a high wage career, or could, or as one paper said with some um, it can make it worse than not taking the course at all. So there was a study that came out on a bunch of VA training programs where they said the net impact of taking the training program was negative. You did worse in the economy. I mean, you have to, do, you have to work really hard to do worse. And so you said, shouldn't we make it easier to do the work so that people can actually distinguish between those two programs? That has a huge impact on them and their families, right? And then people say, well, how do we do that? And then you say, well, so I always find it very useful. Technologists like to live on the gradient of technology. Let me tell you about the technology. What's very useful for policymakers and for funders and others to say, what problem are we trying to solve? And why is this gradient? So I really liked all of Mark's examples. We, like, if we're gonna actually make progress on how do we have you know, algorithms that are fair, large, and actually solving real problems in education, we're gonna need the, you know, large representative data sets. How are we gonna get that? And actually being able to so, sort of define the problem. So that's, I think, one thing, which is I think it's incumbent on us to start with really powerful use cases and then work backwards. And I think that's the entry point. And then saying, here are the technical innovations. I think point number two is um, I actually think that um, part of the power of sort of thinking about this technical layer around privacy is I think most of the time people think about privacy as you know, balancing across two goal sets. Do we want more privacy? Do we want more integration? The, the role that these, these sets of technologies do is that you can actually move across the continuum at the technical layer and not have those trade-offs, right? And so, if you, and so I actually think investing in these technologies is very powerful because over time, it will lead to less need for a trade-off. That still means we have to do all these other things. But I think you need to explain. So for example, you know, the role of federated data. Hey, this data will never leave your phone, so you can actually do the, the final bit of customization on the phone, so you, you know, uh, it never has to leave. 
that's both a communication type thing, but it's also like technologies we're gonna need in an increasingly uh, legal context. I would say the third thing is this sort of culture, talent piece, which is I think people like to fight about the idea and the policy, but like can't actually visualize the human. And that's where like everything breaks down. So I'll give an example. So Congress was considering passing, you know, through various, when National Security Data Service was getting drafted as well as previous iterations of it. And they were gonna like hard code in, you saw the draft, they were gonna take one privacy enabling technology and like hard code it in. So they were like, we've heard of that one. <laughs> it's probably a bad idea to pick one technology and say you must do that. And it was only because there were technical, some technical fellows on the Hill who knew the difference between a technology and a category of technologies that said, well, maybe we should write in somewhat more general language. Um, and that's why that happened. Similarly, like I think in general, the number of people who are able to do this work inside the agencies is really limited. So I also think that like, you know, whether it's rotational programs, whether it's, um, you know, academics, like, you know, uh, spending time inside these agencies and actually developing this knowledge base, I think is going to be very useful. So I think the, you know, funders I think are um, are can be help being enablers with government in getting some of these things started. But I, you know, what I find really refreshing about Mark's comments is that Mark is both saying the why, but then also articulating a lot of the super boring things that catch people, and some of those you can then fix. You can build a rotational program. You can like help you know, c get that first thing going so that people have. You know, and go government operates through precedent. Have we done this before? Does this look familiar? So if you can get something from zero to one, then you, in every next meeting you can be like, it's like this, but for this, right? That's very powerful. So like give them the tools to be able to do that work. So um, yeah, I just want to sort of echo uh, Mark's comments and then say that I think the, the work of people like in this room is to actually generate that to-do list. What are the deep dream sets of projects and other things that will help keep moving the field? And then I think it's like, you know, I'm always happy to help on funders and others who might then be able to get excited, but you know, it's not gonna come the other way where they're gonna say, here's the key thing that you need to work on. Thank you. Uh, Josh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think Mark and Kumar said everything I was going to say, so I'm just going to give my time back to Mark, I guess, um, so he can finish what he was going to say. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I am the facilitator for the Data Funders Collaborative. I'm really excited to be here uh, as part of this conversation, especially with a bunch of Data and tech nerds. Um, unfortunately, I had to be virtual because COVID is still making its way around in New York. And uh, but hopefully, we can talk about data sometime in person. So my background's been in data and analytics for the better part of the last 15 years with nonprofits and with the state of New York. Um, before I joined the GFC in May, I was at a nonprofit called Education Analytics, who you'll hear from in just a bit. Um, and there, I worked with states and districts all over the country on large-scale analytic projects. Um, and at EA, we took privacy very seriously which is probably why Andrew's in the audience and wanted to be there. Um, but I do encourage you to read their very direct um, and open privacy compact on their site. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm here representing the DFC, which some of you may have heard of. Um, for those who haven't, and as the name implies, um, we're a collaborative of 11 uh, foundations who are active grant makers in the data space across issue areas. So not just education, but also in health, workforce development, criminal justice reform, just to name a few. Um, and we have a few goals of the DFC. Uh, the first is to learn together, which we do by joining convenings like these, um, but also inviting experts from the field to regular discussions with us about data-related uh, initiatives and the use of evidence in decision-making. And this year um, on our learning agenda, one of our major priorities is in better understanding the dimensions of privacy as it relates to data use. That's both technical approaches like PETs, but also privacy by design and strategies for building community trust. Uh, some of our funders, like the Ford Foundation, have spent a great deal of time thinking about that social contract, contract that communities should come to expect with respect to their data and privacy. Uh, but as a collaborative, we haven't had a ton of conversations yet, and we want to learn more about how we can be a part of the solution. Um, another goal of our funders is to co-invest in promising initiatives, 
that'll drive the field forward around data and evidence use. You know, that generally means that our funders stay in conversation and share promising initiatives with each other that lead to joint investment. Um, and we've had a few instances that I'd be happy to share with you at some point. Um, but one area we did invest in uh, is a landscape of ways we can increase engagement and in building trust in data use. And we heard, uh, you know, directly from stakeholders that they feel like governmental agencies in the social sector haven't done enough to protect privacy. Um, so uh, we know that doing so would help to build that trust that we want. And uh, that report is on the DFC website. Um, and to Jim's earlier point from the first panel, there's another report about how to help communicators talk about and promote a wide range of data sharing uh, with broad audiences. And the goal of that is to foster constructive and supportive dialogue with more people. Um, because of that research and in our discussions as a collaborative, we absolutely recognize the underlying problem that PDTs are trying to solve. I'd say we think of them as a, you know, a necessary but not sufficient condition for protecting privacy and building public trust. Um, there are plenty of examples of governmental agencies using data in ways that were not agreed to by folks whose data we are meant to protect and use ethically and responsibly. Um, stakeholders, especially parents and families, feel like they don't have control over their data. And even when data are protected and used responsibly, oftentimes the most vulnerable still rightly feel like they're not served well by existing systems, even those that are evidence-based. Um, you know, I was at New York State Ed Department during the Race of the Top era when InBloom was launched, and I got to experience all the blowback um, from folks concerned with philanthropy getting involved and in creating that shared infrastructure that could, could have fundamentally changed the way that we work. But their concern, which I understand, is not feeling in control of their child's data and, of course, around who stands to benefit from that work and the use of that data. Um, so even for funders in the DFC, which uh, you, we were a self-described or self-selecting group of data and evidence nerds, it's really tough to find overlap with the PET enthusiasts because it's such a technical solution. Uh, it feels complex, theoretical, and possible to explain to parents and the public, and so it doesn't appear to solve that public trust issue. You know, in some ways, I personally see it as equally complex as EdFi or just the data standards generally, which are also very necessary to work at scale, or how esoteric it seems to most folks when we talk about improving predictions for some student outcomes. Oftentimes, it's a, a minor improvement that's meaningful to a statistician, but not so much to a parent. You know, so if, you, if for just a moment we assume that PETs are hugely important um, to the evolution of multi-system data sharing and analysis, there's a very big sales job ahead of, uh, ahead of those of us in the room who want to make that happen. You know, that said, um, continuing to build real world applications seems like the right way to create that value proposition for PETs. Um, you know, a couple of examples, the Boston Women's Workforce Council and the Know Before You Go Act, where multi-party computation was successfully used in both instances are great examples. And I think if funders see that PETs can help solve those torturous or downright impossible data sharing challenges, they'll show up. Um, and what does that mean? What is it for them to show up? And, and what could be kind of a barrier or stumbling block? Um, so funders have some ambivalence about these kinds of partnerships with private industry. Um, there are a lot of folks working in private industry who re represent their own companies and approach, but we're often looking for system level change. And sometimes it feels like the philanthropy is expected to be an investor and a regulator. Um, and we need to create tables for honest exchange. And, and that exchange can be two ways um, and not primarily about funding. Philanthropy definitely does not have private industries, technical acumen or market sophistication. Um, and most don't have the deep pockets available like they do from venture capital. Um, we do have access to and credibility, credibility with the most innovative social and public sector leaders. And when philanthropy and its key grantees throw the caution flags you know, about how the public mood is around advanced analytics or AI or data privacy, it's because they're hearing concerns from policymakers, the civil rights community, and agency or districts and state leaders. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it back over to Amy. Now that all three of you have spoken, before I engage the room and the virtual room, do any of you have comments with the other, Mark, it's been a while since you've talked. So I didn't know if, if you had uh, comments. And also I was struck by, you know, it, these are frankly three funders. Um, how much of it should be up to the feds to fund? And not just you, I'm not just picking on IES, but there's a lot of work in the space being funded by NSF, by DARPA, by IARPA, by NIH. They're not here. Like I talked to those folks, but how do we, when we think of the funders, how big of a tent should it be? Because frankly, a, an AI solution in healthcare is only two degrees of freedom from something that could be, you know, 
moved over to Ed or Justice. I, I, I took enough of a risk. <laughs> no, so look, I, I mean, so we've been trying to do partnerships with the National Science Foundation, and we've actually funded two AI entities um, jointly with, with them. Um, and, and one of them is about um, special ed. Um, and the argument there was, look, look at all the advances that have been made in terms of diagnosing for, uh, for medics and, um, and for healthcare using AI and expert science. So I, mean, I have, uh, I, I, every time I say this, like someone kicks me, but I have four grandchildren. I have one IEP and three 504s. So I have a lot of experience with, with special ed. Uh, and so I don't want to over-medicalize it. And, you know, uh, and, and part of the, the deal is, you know, the, the one with the IEP is a 14-year-old boy. And he's just a boy. I mean, he's a goofy, really smart, goofy boy. And schools aren't designed to, to accommodate 14-year-old boys anymore. So that, that, that go, goes without saying. But anyway, um, it goes without saying, I just said. I, I never understood that before. OK. So look, I mean, so, so what we're trying to do is take the advances in AI from medical diagnoses and, and, and treatment plans and try to figure out the way in which this could be ported over to special education. And special education is a, is, is a big deal, not only personally, but I mean, there, there, there are 15, 16, 18% of, of students in the US have uh, IEPs or 504s. So it's a, it's a huge population. Um, so we did that. And then we have another one on STEM education that I, IES is like a um, pretty big player in, in uh, STEM education, except for NSF and everybody else. I mean, you know, we are, um, we, when we, we are part of the, you know, we like to think of ourselves as a small NIH and a small NSF, but they keep getting more money and we don't. So we, we are just, um, so we, we are looking for ways to partner, especially with the NSF, especially with regard to the AI, to uh, expand the tent, if you will, of the kinds of people that we could bring in to education research. So I want to go back to the point about a small industry that's not very good. So part of the reason that we partnered with NSF is because they have a whole other world of researchers. And the question is, could we, through partnerships with NSF, tell people, I and mean, literally tell people, we have money, come and see what the kind of work that we need to be done. NIH is a, a more difficult for us, but the but we work with collab. And again, thanks to Kumar, we've actually worked with uh, NSF on a couple of things, and and looking forward to try to expand that. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Josh or Kumar? You know, it's a good it's a good question on what might be places where agencies could work together. You know, one that I think is probably underappreciated would just be on the talent side, which is if there are researchers or technologists who at least done one high quality interaction with a federal agency, they're like way farther ahead. And some of them at that point might be quite interested in seeing if they could deepen that. So I, you know, that might be an interesting action item on like, if there are a set of folks who are working with you know, DARPA, NSF, IES, others on sort of on the privacy, sort of like privacy, privacy enablement, that might just be useful because like I remember when I was talking to John about things that IES could do, we were like, oh, I wonder, you know, who are like researchers to pull in? Amy, I was like, oh, maybe Amy will know. But like other than that, it wasn't like I had this ready list of folks who both are kind of up on the technology, are able to then think about a high quality part, you know, sort of like come in and help an agency on some project. You know, that list might not actually be that big and borrowing from other agencies for people who've already done it on something related might be interesting. Hi, folks. I'm Andrew Rice from Education Analytics. Uh, I have a question that's so, sort of similar to what was just asked, but uh, it has to do with the shape of the education field. 
Uh, we spend about a trillion dollars in resources in this country in public K-12 education. About 7% of that is coming from the federal government, of most of which is block grants to the states. So the federal government's a teeny tiny player in the, in the education space. And so I guess the question is, do we see that the role here is really at the federal level? Because we just talked about all these national research agencies. Or is it actually somewhere else? And I'm just curious what your opinion is on that. So we have been trying to figure out um, what the next generation of what people call RPPs, research and practice partnerships, are. Um, and so no, no work, we know that no work, uh, that almost uh, no work that we support could be done without partnerships with state and, and LEAs. I mean, that's a given. The question is, what's the right way of doing it? So one of my favorite programs is the SLDS program, the Longitudinal Data Center program. Um, and that's a, I mean, we fund it, right? We've spent, in, in current dollars, we've spent over a, about a billion dollars creating that center. I think there's one state that doesn't have one, but everybody else has. And that was, and, and that was a billion dollars. Uh, half of that came at, at, at of the last emergency ARRA money under the Obama administration. But we, we've given out, um, again, close to a billion dollars. It is now on uh, pretty much life support. There's $35 million in there um, to, to keep that going. And I've been trying to conceive of what the SLDS V2 looks like, right? I mean, we know what some of the components look like. It has to be state partnerships. It has to be giving states enough money so that they revisit the SLDS. Many states are using them for very good purposes. We want to upgrade them. We want to modernize them. And more importantly, um, we've come pretty far in interoperability, but we have to make sure that we push down that road. Because I think the, the part of my vision for SLDS V2 is that we're going to create a modern backbone for data integration. But again, that goes back to the whole thing that we've been talking about. You know, Once we start integrating more and more data into that, then the risks of, of, of exposure become high. The other thing that has to happen is, as we rebuild SLDS V2 is we have to recognize that it has to be a much more open system than the systems that we built. So this is a trade-off, right? Researchers have a hard time getting access to many of those uh, SLDS systems. The, many researchers have very good deals, very you know, tight relationships with state SEAs and, and get almost automatic access to that, which is fine because then some really good people are, are accessing those tools. But what are the rules that we need to open up SLDS V2, especially with emerging other data, how do we, how do we, what are the rules for making sure that those data get used and that we protect the privacy that's involved? I mean, one, um, I sort of agree with the general point. I mean, one related example that I've seen is um, there's, there's lots of potential for interesting intersections between federal agencies and states that want to do under the hood data sharing. So this is happening a lot in workforce data. So because of restrictions that exist for the Department of Labor and how you know, source, data sources, a lot of times they're going to, to their state counterparts and saying, you know, in what instances do you want to have better data on your workforce training programs? And those are you know, fed state partnerships that are, exist around a data agreement. So I think the question is on both sides they're highly constrained by capacity. So the number of people who know how to put these things together and kind of do the underlying uh, pipelines is really limited, but I think the appetite is quite substantial because states are obviously sitting on a quite a bit of resources still uh, coming out of pandemic aid, but um, who can actually design high quality plans for those spends? You know, usually the dynamic when we talk to folks is that they feel a good amount of pressure on the spend side, but like the kind of like, what are important one-time investments that uh, could play out? So one of the things I've said, to, I've talked to Mark about is, 
you know, some of these data systems might be a good one-time investment, but like generating high-quality ideas for how a state could invest in its local SRDS as part of its um, uh, pandemic aid would be an interesting question. Josh? I don't have anything to add. Shakuma's reminded of the, the old standby. You give someone the new system, they get a puppy, but it grows into a dog. Uh, any other questions from Josh? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Michael Klein um, at the US Department of Education in the Office of Education Technology. Um, and I have a question that wanted to tie together a couple things from Josh and Kumar. Um, so Josh, you mentioned the idea that um, PPTs are a necessary, not sufficient condition, and that feels right to me. Um, and I think your piece around kind of trust being the necessary condition, right, for all of this stuff to really work. Um, and so one of the things I'm wondering about and worrying about is just maybe we're assuming good faith on the part of all actors um, when we try to roll these things out. And so one of the things I'm thinking about having worked in mission disinformation response is, um, you know, how might we think about who we're partnering with within the federal interagency, um, as well as external partners around, one, understanding how to speak to the different partners that we have, and two, how to plan for what will sometimes be bad faith actors who will try to undermine these initiatives um, and look like grassroots activists, right? Um, and so one example I would pull out is, you know, if we think about the um, election infrastructure world, right? Um, people are now pushing against the Albert Center Right? These are things that beacon back and just say if people have uh, you know, infiltrated a network, right? Um, and now they're being taken out of election infrastructure because people are worried about sharing data, right? And this is because of bad faith actors sharing missing information, right? So how do we think about that as we plan forward and try to build trust in this space? I mean, one, I, mean I agree, I, I completely agree with you. And I would say one thing that I was thinking about a lot is, um, you know, when I did kind of data analytic work, um, you always just assume like we're good people. We do nice things with data, <laughs> productive things with data. Um, and but there are lots of bad actors out there. And I think, I, th I think one tactic might obviously be something like the student privacy pledge, where with teeth, where you see, you know, a group like, uh, you know, tech groups getting removed from that student privacy pledge for not doing what they committed to doing. Um, so I think things like that that exist out in space could be helpful, at least to some extent. And making sure that we keep the bad actors out of systems and and, and not accessing data. You know, one one idea I liked is um, how do we build more of an incidence database? So, like this happens in cyber all the time, where you log incidents, and so then it becomes easier for people to pick up. But I don't think we have done that as well with fairness or with sort of privacy questions. And so then there's nowhere where like either if you spot it, either as a red team or anything else, you can say, you can log it and then someone has to then say, well, either is this like a true log, is it correct or not? But like those things are, there's a culture of spotting. Um, and so inevitably like the only thing you can do is try to get like someone to cover it. But like one can actually have this as like, these systems are never gonna be either perfect to start, but nor will they be like resilient as just a matter of, right? Like, what we're learning with all systems in when they operate is they're constantly under some version of attack. And so the way you have to, you have to, just have to build a culture of folks who are constantly monitoring and then updating. One, we have to kind of live in that world. And two, uh, you actually have to build up the infrastructure to be able to do it. And I don't know, right now it feels like people are trying to be like, either we are gonna do it if it's secure or we're not gonna do it, but I actually don't know if that's, in most things, that's not the where the technical gradient ends up being. It's actually about system managing the system. I'm gonna stand just because otherwise I can't see Kumar. Jeremy Rochelle from Digital Promise. I really appreciated the comments about um, the need for talent and the need for culture change. And uh, you guys fund a lot. I'm curious, what are the kinds of things that you are funding are bringing new people to the table. Like, yeah, I noticed some of the routine things that IES does, even if you pivot what it says a little bit, the same old people apply. And so I'm just curious, like are the contests doing a better job? Or which, which kind of funding activities are broadening this community? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I 
had the shortest spot I got. <laughs> The, the culture change question is an interesting one. Um, I don't know the answer to that one other than talent. I think on the talent side, um, the piece that, I, one piece that I've been really pushing on is just been how do we make it easier for more technologists and researchers to do tours of duty? Um, <coughs> you know, I came into the government on a fellowship. Um, I think um, there's a number of people at IES I've met who came in under fellowships over the, over the years. And one of the things that I think this, you know, foundations can support this work in part, you know. Um, I actually think that that's a very powerful way in any topic to be able to see more talent to come in. But I also think this is something that the public sector can do more on, which is, right, one, one story I always I tell people is the National Science Foundation has a built-in program line that allows 200 technologists, researchers, lawyers, academics to do tours of duty every year. So like it's a built-in line that allows where NSF will cover 80 to 90% of the cost, the sending, sending institution will do about 10%. That creates a wellspring of talent that comes to NSF. Some of those become full-on program managers, some of them go back to their home institutions. More agencies should have built-in budgets for rotational programs. It can allow them to recruit top talent when new needs pop up, they can bring people. And then once those people are there, if they're like, hey, I wanna be here for longer, that can be really powerful. Agencies that have much more of a rotational structure like DARPA and others, just do a lot better at being at the technical edge because they don't, you know, it's not, it just, there's just, just a lot more flow through their system and then both the folks who are longer term staff inside these agencies just benefit from that. And so um, that's one area on, on talent that we've certainly been supporting some of, but I think agencies can build in as actual program budgets. So, uh, okay, okay, so I have to add some more. because <laughs> <laughs> No, no, look, uh, so part of the deal with Enfin, uh, if we get it, will be this rotational uh, idea. So, uh, and, and to me that's, that's really um, uh, important. Um, you know, and, and we actually have um, accepted service authority, which means we could hire not GS right off the bat, it's like six years, but almost everybody gets converted because the culture is such that after six years, somewhere in the six year period that you're in accepted service, you get converted to GS and then you can start working it out there. Mm -hmm. but, my, my, but my thinking about NCADE is that it will not be that, it will be much more of this rotational model. Uh, Kumar and the, the Federation of American Scientists have been uh, sending people like John to IES. Um, but, you know, there's culture. I mean, there's a culture issue there, right? I mean, you know, so someone shows up and you know, what do we do with them? You know, and how do we integrate them? And then they have different ideas that they have, you know, they want to push. They don't want to, you know, like I'm going to be here for two years. What could I accomplish in two years? So that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, right? That you want to actually accomplish something, you know? So that's, a, I mean, that, 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 goes back to the, that goes back to the kinds of cultural issues that, that are essential. Um, but, but in, in all seriousness, I mean, we, as, as you know, I mean, we, we, we've tried many, 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 many things in the, in the four and a half years that I've been there. And, and you know, the extent to which, A, um, it a actually mattered, I don't know. I mean, we got some of our money, so we, we probably would have gotten it no, one way or the other. But we did this whole big digital learning uh, 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 platform push. Um, you know, so we, I mean, we're just trying different, we're just trying different things. The other thing is we all know, I mean, I'm, my term of office ends in 1.5 years. And, um, and you know, whoever comes next could just like, oh, that was a dumb idea, you know, like uh, forget about that and we'll just go back, you know, to do X, Y, or Z, or here's my stupid ideas and we'll do, you know, A, B, C. And, and you know, I mean, that's just the way it works. So, uh, this is John, I've been referred to a couple times. I'm with IES. <laughs> Um, wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, one of them is that I think Mark is really underselling some of the achievements, right? Four years ago, if you wanted to use a restricted data set at IES, what did you do? People know? You got a CD-ROM, do you remember those, right? Literally, you got a CD-ROM, took it into a data cave on an internet disconnected device and used it, right? Now you can actually like log into 
a virtual server, access data, interact with it, and use it with other people through the Coleridge Initiative. That's like, I mean, light years in achievement in my mind. And so, you know, if we could only use that now internally at IES for our <laughs> staff to access it, right? That's the next, you know, I'll be there another two years. We'll see if we can do that. The other, to Jeremy, to your direct question about are we getting more talent involved through challenges is I think we've gotten some very uneven and mixed kind of participation and responses. I mean, directly within IES, when we did the, the uh, predictive reading challenge, we had an open RFI and we had some really big tech players in the room. We had Amazons, we had Googles. They all came up for the webinar. And then when it came time to do the real work, none of them showed up because they said we didn't have big enough data, right? It wasn't yeah. not only massive, they didn't think it was big although we were able to get really good results. I mean, there's other things where through the learning agency and other challenges, we're engaging with the Kaggle competitions and the Kaggle audience in getting, we're getting Kaggle grandmasters participating because the prizes are raised big enough. And I think that our Kaggle challenge uh, through the learning agency was the top ranked challenge, right? Because it had prize dollars associated. So we are getting some of that new talent that is becoming interested and we do have sizable enough and high quality data for them to be able to use. And that doesn't work in all, all kind of circumstances and we're hearing sometimes for some of the larger scale challenges that doing work on spec is hard for organizations. So I think that's something that we're still figuring out how we engage in. Let's say, you know, with the reading challenge, what I heard back, people were willing to do that on spec because they already had the infrastructure to do that work. Right, these were scoring companies that already did that work. Building something new, a little bit of a different story. So I think that's something that we're still figuring out, but I think we're getting some good responses that are not status quo. So I, I just, my favorite story about the automated reading challenge was um, John ran it. Uh, it um, we had six teams that, that passed the minimum threshold and, and one team were two students, um, graduate students, right, who, who, um, who were like the six. They made it past the, 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 the post. And, um, and then we went to all of them and we, all, all the six finalists and we said, how much would it cost to implement your solution? And, and these two students said $5,000. And we said, like, what would you do with $5,000? We'd buy, we buy two more powerful computers to do that. And like the other bids were like 4 million, 1.5 million. And, and, and you know, so I mean, it, it was so refreshing. Like, all we need is two more powerful computers and we can go and do all this work. All right, well, I want to, you know, it's, it's somewhat exploitative though, because they're not valuing them. I'm a labor economist. I want to go put my arm around them and be like, let me talk to you about these renewable hours. Um, <laughs> But I want to thank you guys. I've not lost sight of your question because there's so much of this has been federal, big picture. And uh, the comment that was made earlier that of the 13,000, a whole bunch of them only have one school. We've got to think about this at all of the levels where the problems exist. But I would love if you could thank Josh and Kumar and Mark, and then we will take a break. <laughs> <laughs>